Okay, cool. Um, is this will this be edited for the? So it's going live to your subscribers. Will you be editing it for the final thing? Okay, cool. So I, if I fluff something up, I can say actually I'll say that. Again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a VIP only live stream with a live interview with mastering engineer Ian Shepard. He is the founder of Production Advice. He's also a professional mastering engineer and the owner of Mastering Media, Media LTD. He also hosts the Mastering Show podcast. With over 20 years of experience, he has worked on thousands of CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays for major record labels, TV stations, and even independent artists. He's also developed two plugins, which I really want to get under the hood and talk about those with meter plugs, including Perception, which won an Audio Media Gear of the Year Award in 2014, and Dynameter, which assists in achieving optimal audio dynamics and competitive loudness for online streaming. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the man of the hour, the man, the myth, and even the legend, Ian Shepard. <laughs> well, thank you. That's too kind. <laughs> and every time I give that introduction with the whole drum roll and the crowd cheer, everyone that I bring on the show is like, I was not expecting that. So, <laughs> Ian, awesome to have you here. So happy to pick your brain. We've already got a few questions, it looks like, in the chat. Um, we're going to try to keep your our meeting time here to about an hour so as to be mindful of your time. Um, but first and foremost, um, Thank you, not only for me, but also from the community. We've all got lots of mastering questions. And uh, I really feel like not only are you equipped to answer them, but I also just feel like um, just your attitude, the way that you, you present yourself on camera and on your videos uh, is a really good fit for my audience. I just love how laid back, simplified the answers are. And um, so, yeah, I'm looking, looking forward to, to diving in there. And so with Without question, I think this is probably the most asked question that I've got. Um, so I want to kind of just throw this one right out there. Um, but in your estimation, what are some of the most common mistakes that beginner audio engineers make when it comes to mastering their audio? Right. Um, I think, okay, so there are common mistakes and then there are ones that people don't think of so much. Mm -hmm. So I mean common mistakes I would say is just trying to make stuff too loud or thinking that it has to be super loud. And I am going to talk about loudness in a second, but actually I want to kind of take it a step back. Okay. Um, I think one of the most common uh, misconceptions I hear is, is in terms of setting up limiters. You know, you, I often hear the advice, Oh, you know, bring down the threshold on the limiter um, until you're seeing a DB2 of gain reduction and you're good. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, that I mean, it, that advice is not always wrong, right? But it, it completely depends. Um, a lot of the time, that's completely unhelpful. Because if you do that to, for example, a heavy rock song and an acoustic guitar ballad, the acoustic ba guitar ballad will end up sounding much, much louder mm -hmm. than the, the heavy rock song. Um, you don't need, probably, maybe you need a tiny bit of limiting, or maybe you don't need any at all on something that's intended to be quiet. Whereas you might need quite a bit more on something that's that's loud. So I think that's one. I think another one is similar where people say, oh, aim for minus 14 LUFS or minus 8 LUFS or minus 6 or any other LUFS value, right? Again, it doesn't make any sense to aim for a specific value for two pieces of music that are entirely different. Um, why would we want everything, acoustic ballads and heavy rock and symphony orchestras and spoken word all to be at exactly the same loudness, right? We don't. What right. you're looking for in mastering is is balance and consistency. You want to flow through from the songs, whether it be on an album or on a, as part of a, a podcast or a, or a TV show or within a playlist, whatever it is. You want the songs to sound right in comparison to each other. So aiming for a specific LUFS value, I would say, is a huge, you know, Every day I see people saying, how loud should I master this stuff? And the answer is not a particular number. And I do have some guidelines if 
you know people are interested and we could maybe get into that later and then i think the other thing that i often see people do is imagine that mastering is somehow doing the same thing to every song um you know so you have five six seven you know maybe you've got an entire album worth of, of songs and you line them all up and you go okay so this is my cue setting and this is my limiter setting um and if you again that might work if the songs are all really balanced already but the the opportunity you've got in mastering is to improve on the balance between the songs um and to get them working even better next to each other and to you know if this one needs a little bit more bass or this one needs a little bit more treble or maybe this one's a little bit too loud to fix all of that stuff so the the, the key to it is to have uh separate settings individualized settings for each song that you're working on um in order to get them to work better together as a whole um so yeah there's there's three that i kind of came up with nice um, and this isn't on my list of questions, but it's, it's something that I, I definitely wanted to ask too. So how do you think that differs now that we're in sort of the mindset has changed? I feel like as, whereas used to, you know, take it like 10, 20 years ago, it was like, let's make it an album. Let's make an entire CD. And we had all of these songs sort of structured and mastering it all to fit well, like you just talked about volume wise, so that one song isn't blasting in your ears. And now, when it comes to singles and EPs, like most people are releasing these days, like how has the, how has the infrastructure of all that changed? So for me, it hasn't really changed. Um, I, I mean, it's, I prefer to work that way. I think mastering is most valuable when you've got a collection of songs that are intended to work together. Um, because that's when you can make the, you know, even the order of the songs might change slightly. Mm -hmm. the, the final decisions that you make, you know, depending on whether you're going from something loud into something soft or, or vice versa. Um, but even when I'm working on single songs, uh, I like to imagine that they're going to be on an album. Um, and usually that would be an album of that particular artist. Um, gotcha. You know, so it's not like I'm trying to make everybody's stuff fit into a particular it's like okay well what's the sound i think is right for this artist that's how am i really going to help them achieve their goal you know understand what they're trying to to do and get them closer to it mm -hmm. um and if i just have one song then i'll just think about it in terms of other stuff that is out there that i think sounds fantastic um or if i've already done one song for them then i can sometimes i'll even put them into the same uh, playlist in the daw so that i can literally skip between them um and that works pretty well, you know. It's not uh, it's not perfect, and sometimes if they do say actually we want to put these this collection of songs out as a as an EP or as an album, there might be little adjustments needed here or there. Um, but yeah, I still like to to think about things that way, even if it's not because, I mean, the other thing, you know, again, with this is something we can talk about more these days. The thing that has changed, people are releasing single songs and just groups of songs much more often, um, and they're all getting heard for the first time online. Um, quite possibly you know in a playlist shuffled up with a bunch of other stuff that they were never intended by you to to be with originally right um so in that case the goal is to just get them to to work really well in that context and that's that's super challenging because you don't know what that context is um but i've come up with a set of guidelines for myself that you know uh, well i say i've come up with it I, I actually haven't that what i've found is that the way that i have been working for 25 years now works really well in the online environment as well um you know the, the you hear people saying oh you've got to do different things mastering for streaming than you did for cd and i, I don't agree with that perspective um, my experience is you know because all of the technology that the streaming services are using to try and get a great listening experience for us by turning down the loud songs and all the rest of it are based on all the great sounding music from the past um so the stuff that I was doing five or ten years ago for CD, for me, still works in an online situation as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, I, I basically haven't really changed the way that I work, except that, whereas back in the day, I might have considered, OK, how is this going to work if it gets sent off to be cut for vinyl? I mean, that that's becoming more common again these days, but there was a point where that was really rare. Um, now I'm thinking, you know, I'll, I'll do the mastering and I'm just doing what I think is best for the music, you know, what works for the 
to to achieve the goals of the artist and the the, the client the producer um and then i kind of take a step back and think okay now how's that going to work in an online situation and i mean actually i i don't have to think that much about it because most of the time it does just work but every so often you you something kind of you think okay so that's going to be turned down or adjusted in volume and therefore i might tweak something you know just to, or maybe this is super hot this master so i need to leave a little bit of extra peak headroom because of streaming codecs that, that kind of stuff um but yeah basically it works pretty much the same as it ever has wow that um man that sums up a lot of questions honestly that i've had too because uh, you've kind of pointed or rather alluded to a couple times about some standards that you kind of go off of or at least some ways that you approach things do you have like um some kind of a link or something like that we could end up sharing where we could go and get more information about that because that would be super helpful to know sort of how you're approaching them from from your aspect yeah absolutely there's um a uh, a, bl a blog post on my on my website productiondevice.co.uk um and now you've caught me on the spur of the moment i'm not gonna be able to think what the url for it is um i think it's productionadvice.co.uk slash how dash loud okay um we'll make sure to fact, search that out too and and get you the right the link here uh, within the vip membership and before we post anything anywhere else um, yeah but that's that's excellent advice too because it, yet again not on my list but i felt like this was kind of going to happen because i feel like i'm picking your brain more than these people are asking questions too so you guys are awesome but i don't i need to see some more questions here in the chat if you guys have any um, oh, it looks like my uh, moderator has found it, actually, and has posted the link. Awesome. Thank you Excellent. so much, DJ. Um, cool. What I was going to say about just before we leave that, mm -hmm. that, I mean, I can summarize, you know, that, that blog post kind of sets out what my guidelines are and why I think they work. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the golden rule, as far as I'm concerned, is to master the loudest sections of each song to be similar. They don't have to be exactly the same. And, mm, and obviously okay. how loud you decide to master is, is a, a choice depending on the material and, you know, your concerns about the loudness war. Um, but so for me, for example, I would say minus 10 LUFS short term for the loudest sections is really good and loud. Um, if you leave 1 dB of true peak headroom at the top of that, so peaks no higher than minus one, you're going to be in great shape. And then you just balance everything else musically. So, you know, if, if if it's loud all the way through, then it'll be up near minus 10 the whole way through. And if if there's kind of a big contrast between the verse and the chorus, then you can you can judge that musically um, and it's going to work really well. And if there's a song that's much, much quieter, then that will work as well. And you don't have to push it as loud because it's intended to be quiet. Um, but that's I found that and it even works really well between genres, um, you know, because, for example, if you've got, I don't know, something like EDM or where things are loud all the way through, Okay, so they're loud all the way through and every song comes out loud. Whereas if you've got something like, I don't know, progressive rock or jazz or something where there's a lot more variety, yeah. the loudest sections of those songs might get up to the same kind of level and the rest of it sits somewhere below, but it all just works musically. Um, and when you do that, it also tends to play really well with the, the loudness normalization stuff online as well. So that's, a, that's the basic strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a moment of clarity with Ian Shepard. <laughs> wow, dude, you just like, wow. Okay, so that, talk about simplification. Like that was like golden right there. Because, and uh, my apologies to all of you who I have been uh, mastering on these live streams. And I've even told you guys, like I'm not a mastering engineer. I'm just kind of like getting it louder. Uh, but my apologies to all of you who I have led astray. <laughs> um, thank you Ian, yet again for coming on here and, and helping to curb that. Um, because see, I was under the impression that like sort of the middle of the line, like you just need to hit for negative 14 LUFS and you're good. And I, what I was finding out was like, yeah, that's sometimes, but it's not working all the times. And so you just like totally... Yeah. My mind is yeah, blown. Well, ex exactly. And that's why, you know, I said right at the top, one of the, the big mistakes I see is people aiming for minus 14. Mm -hmm. um, if you just think of, you know, two kind of classic tracks, you know, if you think of Back in Black by ACDC 
and Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin, right? Yeah, Back in Black. Yeah, different, yeah. Well, it, it, but they're both kind of from the same, that same era. They're both, you know, rock, basically. Mm-hmm. Pretty aggressive sound to them. Um, at the end, at least, of Stairway to Heaven. Um, you know, and the difference between them is that Back in Black comes in and it just rocks all the way through, beginning to... Dun, 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 that right. same riff all the way through. Stairway to Heaven starts with acoustic guitars and, you know, Mellotrons and all the rest of it, and then builds up to this massive uh, final section, right? Um, So if you measure the overall loudness of those and you make Back in Black minus 14 and you make Stairway to Heaven minus 14, just for the sake of argument, Mm -hmm. what you will find is that the end of Stairway to Heaven gets way louder than ACDC. And maybe it should be a little bit louder. I mean, exactly, you know, these are all just kind of rules of thumb. But I don't think it should be way, way louder. I think it should be probably at a similar kind of level. And then the beginning of Stairway to Heaven is really, really quiet in comparison to that that huge ACDC riff. Um, and so, so aiming at the same number for both of them is not going to work. It doesn't make sense musically, and it's not going to achieve the result that you're looking for. Whereas if you take the loudest sections of both of them and make it about minus 10... You'll find that they sit really nicely in comparison to each other, and the, so the, then the measured loudness of Stairway to Heaven, because it ends louder but it begins quiet, will be somewhere in between. So, you know, if if the end of both of them is at minus ten, then Back in Black overall is going to be about minus ten because it's that's what it is all the way through. But Stairway to Heaven might come out at minus fourteen or minus sixteen, um, and that's fine because what you want is the loud bits to be comp- to to work well next to each other to balance well. Um, so when I'm mastering, I find that, you know, I follow those rules and yeah, on a, on a varied album with, you know, lots of different types of, of songs on it, or say a compilation album where everything's really kind of, uh, different styles and, and arrangements and productions, and all the rest of it, you could, you could have a range between anywhere, but I mean, you, maybe some of them go a little bit louder than minus 10. Um, if they're, you know, if, if, if that's the intent, if they're, that works for the material mm-hmm. but you could easily have stuff down at minus 16 maybe even minus 18 if it's super quiet um but it all fits together musically um and then if it gets played online as an album then on spotify and on uh apple music and on tidal those streaming services know that it's an album so they'll keep those relationships so it'll all still work musically on youtube it's a bit more of a free-for-all because well, there, they turn the loud stuff down and they don't turn the quiet stuff up. So again, that's another reason not to go super loud, right? Because if you master super loud, it'll get turned way down. And then in comparison to the quieter songs, it won't sound loud enough. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a complicated business, but that has been, you know, I've been teaching that for, well, my, my, my entire career, basically. Um, my entire career as an educator, I should say. So 10 or 15 years. Um, and, you know, people just keep telling me, it works it's it's super uh powerful technique yeah absolutely i can definitely see like already you've just created so much clarity and i like i said you blew my mind it was a small explosion but you blew my mind nonetheless um wow which this is kind of crazy um but i literally just finished mastering a 12 minute long song it's a medley that we did with our worship band and uh it's, it's all over the place. Like it starts out with a cello and a violin. It builds up to like full blown. We've got saxophone, um, aux keys, organ keys, two guitarists, drummer, bassist. I mean, it's massive and there's 29 tracks total in this thing. But what I did was I broke my own rules of this whole negative 14 thing that I was shooting for. And I listened, imagine that, and was like, this is crazy that you're saying this because I was literally like bouncing around negative 10, negative 11 and everything was sounding like awesome. When I took it to the car, did the old car test, I was like, wow, this actually sounds really good. And so now you're saying this today and it's almost like (laughs) start using your ears, man. Um, wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy mistake. Uh, You can understand why. I mean, if you go to Spotify's, um, website and, and kind of, you know, look for their recommendations. Yes. They, well, what they actually, I can't remember, I haven't looked at it recently. What it used to say was, if you don't want the loudness of your music to be changed, aim for minus 14. Right. Right. Which is accurate because their distribution loudness 
the, the loudness that they try and get all the loud stuff to is minus 14. Um, but who says that we don't, that we care whether music gets turned down? Um, if everything else that's loud is at minus 14, it doesn't matter if our stuff that's loud is at minus 14 as well. So if we want to go a little bit louder than that originally and have they to decide to adjust the level, well, that's not the end of the world, you know? It's more about how does it match up with everything else um, that we need to, to care about and make sure that when you listen to things at minus 14, everything still sounds good. Um, so that's always the advice I give to people is, is master it so that you're musically happy with the results. Then take your favourite reference track, whatever it is, put them both at minus 14. I mean, it doesn't have to be minus 14. That's just the most common one that, you know, most yeah. of the streaming services are using right now. The, the point is at a similar loudness, just because that's how they measure it. And then you'll hear it as you're going to hear it on the final streaming service. And you can say to yourself, yeah, I'm happy with the way that sounds. Or actually, maybe I'll just tweak that introduction up a little bit more so that, you know, the the intro doesn't get lost after this super loud song. And that's why I put together the, the loudness penalty website. Uh, with the meter plugs it, that it does exactly that you you loudnesspenalty.com you go there you can drag a song on um it doesn't get uploaded just gets uh calculated in the browser and it will tell you oh on youtube this is going to be turned down by 2db or 3db or whatever um and you can preview it that's the important bit the numbers are not so important as previewing it listen to it at minus 14 and then you can compare it with whatever you want on Spotify or YouTube or wherever it is um, and hear it as it's going to gonna sound. So, you know, it's it's quite a simple idea, but it's also quite confusing. Um, and, and yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to give this advice as often as I can because I think it's, it's, it's catching a lot of people out. You kind of think, oh, because they are turning loud stuff down to minus 14, that's what we should aim for. And it, that kind of makes sense, but that's not the best approach. Yeah. And that's what I feel like a lot of these companies that I don't think they really, when they have their board meetings and they say like, Hey, let's do something. I don't think they call in audio engineers and they're like, Hey, is this going to trash everyone's audio or is this going to like, for instance, uh, on the band lab app, I'm a band lab affiliate. I've been working with band lab and, and cakewalk for years. And one of the things that just like really just like burns my biscuits is when they put on their website, like maybe they'll have an artist come on there and they'll say, Hey, download the stems from such and such artist. But then you get on there and it's multi-tracks and it's like little stuff like that, which now thanks to people like Bob clear mountain individuals like yourself and others are like, Hey, Hey guys, there's a difference between stems and multi-tracks. Thankfully, because people have been championing this, this issue that it's finally starting to get turned around. And I've actually talked to like one of the head VPs, of band lab and was like, please change it because it, it makes you guys look stupid. You're <laughs> and they're like, uh, well, they are stems. I'm like, no, they're, they're multi-tracks. You like, anyway, um, I don't want to get off on the weeds about that, but, um, no, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a fair point. It's, and, and I should say that I do think normalization on, on Spotify and YouTube and title overall, it's a good thing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not perfect right now, but it is improving. It's improved dramatically in the last five years. And I think it will improve more, in future um i mean just to, just as an interesting kind of point what we were just talking about tidal is the only one of those currently that does what the aes uh, recommend yeah. um, which is they don't make all the songs the same loudness they measure an, an album and they find the loudest song on the album and they turn the loudest song down that's what's called album normalization so that keeps all of those relationships that we choose at the mastering stage between the songs so songs that are meant to be loud stay loud and songs that are meant to be quiet stay quiet and it just balances entire albums next to each other and it does it all the time even in shuffle and the interesting thing is that most people prefer it that way it sounds more musical because you don't have that problem of a song that's meant to be quiet sounding too loud in comparison to a song that's meant to be loud um so hopefully you know that's another change that we might see on spotify and youtube in future that just makes this stuff better because I know some people get annoyed and they're kind of like, oh, I did all of this work getting my song to sound great at minus eight LUFS or whatever it is. And then they turned it down. Um, yeah. And I, I appreciate the frustration there, but actually it's a fantastic thing because it gives us all the freedom to do what's best creatively. You know, the problem without normalization, everybody's like, well, I have to make everything minus eight. Otherwise it's going to get lost amongst the, the loud stuff. And you have to do that, whether it's artistically uh, the right thing to do or not. 
Whereas with normalization, we can say, OK, I know that my stuff's not going to get blown out of the water by the, the super loud stuff. So I have the, the, the freedom to give this song a little bit more space to breathe, you know, for the, to allow this one to step back a little bit and to get that light and shade in there. Um, if you want to use it, if, if you don't, you don't have to. You can just still make everything super loud. But if that's not what you're going for and actually, you know, you would prefer to have a bit more variety because, you know, the, the song you just described, that medley, you don't want the whole thing to be super loud all the way through, right? Because no. you put that contrast in there for a reason, you know? It's, you, you move from one thing to another to, to, to surprise and delight the people listening. And so to, to, to have to try and get rid of that variety would just be a, a real shame. So, yeah, I, I do think it's a good thing. It's not perfect and it's, it's, it's unnecessarily complicated, but, you know, hopefully <laughs> it, will, it will continue to improve. Well, that's a great way to flip the narrative too from sort of the way that it's being explained and, and talked about now. So, because right now, I mean, everything, it seems like, of course, that's kind of the world we live in now too. Everything is in a negative connotation. Everyone is so negative. It seems like anymore. And that's why it's so great to find individuals like yourself who are able to take that and say, well, here's another way to look at it. Like they're not all evil because they're doing this through music. It could just be your, you know, the way that you're actually producing the music could be the production elements that you're you're putting in it could be any number of factors but I like the way that you just put that about you know I think it also it makes you more mindful of the decisions that you're making and so it sort of makes you focus more on the music itself instead of just what loudness is it is yep absolutely um and, and what I would say is you know I think people don't remember I mean I remember writing about Spotify's loudness normalization in 2009 and I think I made a blog post called Spotify Will End the Loudness War. Um, now, clearly, I spoke too soon <laughs> in, in that case. Um, here we are 15 or 14 years later. Um, but the alternative is so much worse. You know, it's when you have if, if you have a playlist where something comes in and it's 10 dBs louder than the thing you were just listening to or 10 dBs quieter. It can be super frustrating at worst, and it can damage your speakers or your hearing even even worse, worse. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not perfect, but I, I, I do think overall it's a positive thing. Awesome. Well, I, I didn't want to get into this topic, but I have to. Um, because honestly, I like I have a completely different outlook on this whole topic myself. And. For those of you who are here in the chat, you're going to know exactly why, but I need to ask the question anyway, because I know that it comes up all the time and I want to make sure that I'm at least serving my audience. So how important is room acoustics when it comes to mastering audio? Okay. Um, not at all. If you use headphones. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nail on the head right there. <laughs> because, well, I mean, but that's not a joke. Um, you know, I... So I have a, an online course called the Home Mastering Masterclass, mm -hmm. um, which I made and I, I used headphones to master all of the songs there. Um, it's not ideal. It's not my preference. I prefer to work on speakers, but it's absolutely possible, especially these days with, you know, correction software like uh, Sonoworks coming available yeah. and, you know, just higher quality headphones um, coming onto the market. And yeah, I mean, one of the huge obstacles to getting great sound is... I mean, A, you need great speakers, but then you need a decent space to put those speakers in. And depending on, you know, not many of us have the, the you know, the ability to build a huge recording studio <laughs> in, in our homes and do the full acoustic treatment that, you know, ideally you would have. Um, so in some ways, you know, and there are some big name mastering engineers now uh, working on headphones. Um, you know, it also allows you to be portable and, and all the rest of it. So... It's not for me, but it, it's definitely an option. If you're using speakers, I would say it's the second most important piece of equipment you own after the speakers. You know, people don't tend to think of acoustic treatment, you know, panels and things as equipment, but it, it absolutely is. I mean, if you've mm -hmm. got a good set of speakers, then almost certainly paying maybe a thousand dollars on some acoustic treatment will get you uh, five times the improvement that spending an extra thousand dollars on a on a better pair of speakers would in an untreated room you know Absolutely. it's 
the, the, the bang for your buck in terms of investing in some acoustic treatment. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, this is this is not a proper studio. This is my, my room at home. Um, I set it up when I left the company I was working with and I was dry hiring their room and then they went they went bust. And I was working at a, a studio run by a friend of mine and I just needed the ability to hear things accurately so that I could give people feedback because they would send me things saying, does this is this going to benefit from mastering? Um, and I would say, I will tell you that in three days time when my next session is booked, you know, and that's just that wasn't kind of quick enough for people. So this used to be uh, the garage, the garage um, mm -hmm. of, of of our house. Um, it's not a great shape. It's not big enough for my taste, um, but it, it's what we had. So I converted it and I couldn't resist the first day I came in here that literally the paint was still drying and I set up the speakers and I, I put on some of my favorite CDs and I just thought, oh no, you know, I've, <laughs> we've just spent not, yeah. not a fortune, but a sizable amount of money on making a room that is unusable. <laughs> um, and then literally the next day, uh, the acoustic panels that you can see behind me and there's more in front of me and over my head um, arrived from GIK Acoustics and I set them up um, put the CD back on again. It was like, oh, thank goodness. You know, <laughs> actually, it's. I mean, it, it transformed the, yeah. the room, and and it went from literally went from unusable to very usable. And actually, I would say I've added a few extra bits since then, but um, I, I got super lucky with this room. It sounds way better than I ever expected or uh, deserved, to be honest. Because you know, it was literally a case of this is the space I have. I'm going to make the the best of it, and the acoustic treatment is a huge part of that. So, it sounds like you that you agree with me on this. I do. And the reason why a lot of them are probably chuckling right now is because I actually do a predominant amount of mixing and mastering on my headphones. And I've got a lot of people that are like, there's no way you can do that. And which I always tell people, like, if you ever find anyone online that says there's only one way to do it, or there's no way that you can do this, like run as fast as you can away from those people. They're either trying to sell you snake oil or they really just don't know what they're talking about. Because I mean, like try to tell the Beatles that there's only one way to do something. You know, I mean, how many great effects do we have now? Because they were like, let's try something new. Let's try something different. Thank you, DJ, by the way. Like everything that you have talked about as far as like websites or links to your website, he's already got it here in the chat for everybody to benefit from. So thank you for that. Um, and then the other aspect of that that I was, other than just doing a predominant amount of, of work on my headphones is I always will, before I send out the final mix or master, I always check on my speakers. I have the Cali Audio speakers. Uh, which have this excellent switch on the back that if they're up against the wall, which mine have to be because of my space, you can actually, it will make like an internal adjustment for that. And I noticed when I upgraded to these speakers with the minimal amount of, of you know, room of like absorption that I've gotten here, and it's mainly just like broadband frequency absorption. There's no bass traps or nothing crazy. Um, it was like night and day difference. Like I was going from six and seven revisions to like, two and three revisions, which is huge when you're on a time frame and you got people beating down your door every day going, where's my masters? Where's my, where's my mix? Um, but I, that's a really little, yet again, clear and concise answer. I love the way that you're explaining everything. So, um, this next question is going to sort of dovetail very nicely into this, but what are some, according to you, at least, um, what are some essential tools or plugins that you need to master your own audio? So the, uh, the simple answer is, is none. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I mean that quite seriously. I mean, well, it, that's a slightly clever answer, right? Because right. these days, any DAW, you know, Cubase, Logic, Pro Tools, Reaper, um, Fruity Loops, whatever it is people are using, chances are it's going to have the tools you need to do a great job built in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I do sometimes is go out to colleges um, around the UK here and I do a talk called Mastering Essentials where I kind of give a, a one hour introduction to th the, the topic of mastering, the, the pros and cons, the benefits. You know, we talk about the loudness war, all this kind of stuff. And then afterwards, I'll often do a workshop where I get students to, you know, they bring a USB drive with a song they've been working on on it. And I just do a demonstration where I show what you can achieve just using eq and a limiter and when i say using the limiter the limiter is literally just catching the peaks yeah. um 
And you can take three songs that sound like they're from different planets and make them sit really happily next to each other, just with an EQ and a limiter. And, you know, any EQ will do, genuinely, um, you know, any digital EQ at any rate. Um, because, you know, we just, you, you mentioned the Beatles, you know, the people can't get their heads around the fact that in terms of quality, a, a $200, $300 laptop these days, in terms of the specifications at least, will beat the the tech that they had back in the, the 60s right. and 70s recording all those amazing albums. Um, I'm not saying you're going to get all of the character and the, you know, the, the vibe and all, all the rest of it, um, but just in terms of the, the quality of what we have available to us for almost no money. Um, so that's, that's the slightly clever answer. The slightly more sensible answer is you basically need EQ, compression, and limiting. Those are, th those are the three tools. Um, that is what I use on 90% of the stuff that I master. Um, the other 10% is things like stereo image processing and saturation and you know all, all the, the kind of fun stuff that, that everybody likes to talk about. But really, all you need is... I mean, when I started out, it was much more EQ and limiting. And the limiting was very, very transparent and, and hands off because the loudness levels weren't so so high back then. Right. Um, this is in the early 90s. Um, so, yeah, you probably didn't even use that much compression then. Um, and these days, often what I'm doing is using compression much, much more gently than, than people maybe imagine. You know, uh, it's in, in recording and mixing, it's this no holds barred creative tool. Um, and in mastering, for me, it's much more about being invisible you know i want to manage the dynamics and, and optimize the dynamics without anybody i don't want anybody to listen to it and go wow listen to the mastering compression on that yeah. you know i want them to listen to it and go i love this song oh you know and it makes them want to dance or laugh or cry or sing um you know that you want the emotional impact of the music to come through not for people to be thinking about the technicality so i want what i've done to be invisible most of the time um i think maybe in terms of tools that people might not think of the other ones that i would mention are meters um not they're not essential but they're incredibly useful especially when you're starting out especially when you're learning you know i remember when i i mean i didn't have a daw when i started mastering i had a i had a desk and i had a, some you know some outboard gear and and two tape machines um but i also had a, an old-fashioned vu meter you know the just a moving coil the needle um, that gives you an impression of of loudness, and there was a peak meter on the on the desk, um, and I had a really simple, I think maybe eight band frequency meter that just kind of gave me a rough idea of the overall shape, and I was given, a, you know, I was lucky enough that I had mentors and I was I was trained to to do what I do, and and the the guidelines that were given to me were, you know, round about this level at the loudest moments, which you know is a theme you're going to recognize from earlier on. Um, don't let the peaks go above zero. Back then, zero was the limit. These days, I recommend minus one. Um, and uh, a broadly balanced EQ shape, you know? So not masses of bass, unless that happens to suit... I mean, if it's a if it's a, a stand-up bass solo in a jazz uh, song, then loads of bass. Right. But, you know, if you've got a full band and it's a, it's a, a kind of a full arrangement then roughly equal frequency response across the frequency ranges just rolling off gently in the high frequencies because that's the way that natural sound works and you know those by modern standards in comparison to you know what you get with almost any eq plug in these days or certainly things like um you know the isotope tools or um you know the, the more advanced metering uh options that we have they were really really simple but they were incredibly valuable um these days I don't really watch them. I might check them every so often or refer back to them if I kind of if I'm kind of scratching my head about something. Um, but especially when you're learning, that they're, they're super helpful. So I think having you know a peak meter just so you can see whether or not it's clipping, a loudness meter these days. I, I still like VU meters. Um, I remember when I I mentioned I left the company where I worked for all those years and I didn't have that analog vu meter anymore and i remember the day i discovered that there was a, a plug-in that emulated it i was delighted um <laughs> so i still use that traditional vu meter i find it really helpful for for judging loudness um and an eq meter but but not um not a super detailed one it's so easy to get kind of caught up in all the the, the oh yeah 
the details of those and, and just start obsessing. I, I, I tweak the settings so that you get a really gentle, broad shape visible to you. So it just kind of helps you, you know, because everybody gets, you know, you, you get tired or you get used to the way that something sounds and maybe you lose sight of, you know, what you were originally trying to do. And if a quick glance at the meter, you kind of go, oh, have I got too much bass there suddenly? You know, the, the, that's a, a great reality check. So, yeah, I would say EQ, compression, limiting and some good meters. Awesome. So then what are some techniques that you would employ on a, on a, or a master rather? Um, for achieving sort of that balanced frequency spectrum? So it's less about, I mean, techniques. I mean, in, in, literally in mastering, you know, I'm sure people watching know this, but th you're working on the stereo files, you know, mm -hmm. not occasionally you might work on stems, <laughs> meaning stems, almost, I mean, well, never on the multitracks. If, 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 if you're talking about a multitrack, then you're back into the mixing stage. Right. But I mean, 95% of the time I'm working on stereo mixes. So you're literally just applying an EQ over the whole file. So, I mean, just for example, let's say somebody's uh, mixing on NS10s and they mm -hmm. don't have a sub or the Yamaha HS8s, I think, are the modern equivalent. Um, you know, they're small. They're um, very accurate in the mid-range. The bass is very, very controlled, but there's not a huge amount of it. So it's quite common that if somebody is mixing on that because they want to feel the bass in the room they actually end up putting more bass in to compensate for those speakers right. and then when they get out into the world and it's it's played in a maybe a car stereo with a big bass bin in it or a you know a pair of beats headphones or something with more bass response or just a, a full range pa system or something suddenly that bass sounds too much and that's the kind of adjustment you make at the mastering stage is you have very neutral flat um monitoring that doesn't have any of those it doesn't hype the, the highs or hype the lows or anything it's very very uh, accurate and reliable and you can hear okay there's a little bit too much low end in that so you might use a low shelf you know just to just to um flatten that off and maybe when you do actually there was a bit of a little bit of a lump in the base so when you take the whole thing down maybe you get the overall amount of bass right and there's still that lump so then you go in with a, a parametric eq with a bell curve just to, to even that out a little bit um and then because you've reduced the bass, suddenly actually maybe the high mids sound a little bit harsh in comparison. I like to say, you know, it's a bit like um, Newton's laws. You know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So for every EQ, there's an equal and opposite EQ. If you reduce the bass, you'll notice the, the highs and the, the mids more. So again, it's all about balance. Um, so you're literally just uh, using often fairly gentle, broad EQ curves to, to correct that balance. The trick is is knowing what to do, right? Mm. And the challenge, um, because especially if you're trying to master on the same system that you've just mixed on, you've already made it sound as good as you can. So probably when you come to, to master it, you just sort of think, well, what do I need to change, right? Um, so, and I think the, the, the best strategy I can give you there is, or there are two ideas. One is to go and listen to it somewhere else. Um, it needs to be somewhere you know really well. There's a there's a great saying I like, which is that um, a man with a watch can tell you what the time is, but a man with two is never sure. Um, <laughs> and the same is true of monitors, right? If you've got speakers, you know what the music sounds like. If you've got speakers and headphones, well, it sounds one way on the speakers and it sounds the other way on the headphones. Which one is right? Um, so if you're going to go and listen to things somewhere else, it needs to be somewhere you know really well. It doesn't have to be super high quality. It could be a pair of earbuds. It could be a smart speaker. It could be hi-fi system head out there give yourself a rest finish the mix give it ideally a few days maybe a week or two then listen to it with fresh ears on a different system have a notepad and paper and if something kind of bothers you if you have some questions note them down then come back into the studio where you do all the rest of the work and listen again and try and figure out whether those are real things that you heard and whether actually oh now i think about it you know actually maybe it could stand a little bit more low end or whatever those adjustments are um the other thing you can if you don't hear it when you come back into studio maybe it's worth listening to it in a few other places if you hear it everywhere that's a good sign that you've missed something in the studio if you only hear it in that one place you know if it's just that one pair of earbuds where it sounds a bit tinny that's probably the earbuds so you don't need to worry about it too much yeah. um but try and get that that outside perspective on what you're doing um and then the other thing you can do is use reference material so just um find some great sounding similar um material so it's in a similar genre you know not 
I, I literally had somebody give me a, a hard rock album to master and they they mentioned Fleetwood Mac as a reference and I mean I love the sound of Fleetwood Mac as well as all the hard rock stuff that I love but it's not a very useful reference for a hard rock right. album um so find something that's kind of in the right ballpark and this is the important bit it has to sound great to you everywhere right that's the clue because one of the goals of mastering is you want things to translate you know we all one of the things that people do is you you build a little audio cave in your house somewhere um, and you come in there and you work intensively on your music and you never listen to anything else and then you go out into the rest of the world and suddenly it sounds bizarre and wrong and that's because you never figured out what it was supposed to sound like in the studio space so one other thing you can do is just listen to a ton of music in your mixing or mastering space you know don't, you don't have to listen kind of carefully just stick it on in the background while you're doing emails or surfing the web or soldering cables or whatever it, you know whatever it is and over time your brain will kind of go okay this is how things are meant to sound in this room that's super helpful um but then the other thing is yeah find things that sound great in your car sound great on the earbuds sound great on the smart speakers you know wherever you listen to them you think oh, i love the way this sounds those are great reference tracks bring those into the studio compare them to your mix um making sure to match the loudness so if they're probably mastered louder than your mixes to begin with so reduce the mastered level of the reference tracks um, so that the loudest sections of your song and their song are similar. So same rule as before, right? Balance the loudest sections and then start listening to them. And if you find that the reference track has got more bass, maybe your song should have more bass. If the reference track has got less bass, maybe yours should have less. Um, if they are balanced and they sound great everywhere and you match them in the studio, that will help your stuff sound balanced as well um you know it'd be great it'd be awesome if somebody invented a plug-in that would match the loudness hmm hmm <laughs> if they did they'd probably call it perception ab hey, and make it available at metaplugs.com <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i mean you know w w thank you for for uh, you know teeing that up for me but the I mean, I'm talking a lot about loudness. It's mm -hmm. not actually because I'm obsessed. I, I, one thing, people think I hate loud music, and that's absolutely not the case. I love loud music as much as the next person. What I'm worried about is people feeling like they have to make their stuff super loud without good reason. Um, but one of the reasons I'm so interested in loudness is it's, it's at the root of everything. I mean, if you just take two songs and play one of them a dB quieter than the other, the chances are people will prefer the slightly louder one, even though they're otherwise exactly the same. Right. You know, no different processing, anything else. It's just a volume change. So when I'm mastering, the first thing I do is bring the thing that I'm mastering up to roughly the right loudness. Because if I EQ that at low loudness and then increase the level, suddenly that EQ is going to sound wrong to me. It's going to sound like it's got too much bass and treble because our ears hear different frequencies uh, differently at different loudness levels right is uh, it's a thing called fletcher the, the munzer curve exactly the equal loudness curves fletcher munson um yeah they also call it the smile curve because as you as you turn things down you have to boost the treble and bass to get them to, to keep them sounding and you know nobody knows it's not um it's not an acoustics thing it happens in our brains and it, it might um anybody who's heard me talk about this before will roll their eyes at this but it it, it it might be because of evolution right where it's more important to pay attention to the saber-toothed tiger that's breathing down our neck than the one that's over there stalking a herd of gazelles this one is a bigger threat if we pay more attention to it we're more likely to survive longer um, therefore our brain assigns more importance to sounds that are close um, and one way that it does it is make us think they have more bass and treble they more ear catching uh, that may or may not be true but the, the fact is loudness affects everything um you know it's when you're comparing with reference tracks and when you're comparing your stuff online it's super important to balance the loudness just because if you don't you're likely to just get fooled by the fact that something is i mean it still happens to me you know somebody will send me uh you know some kind of reference track to to listen to i think oh wow that sounds amazing that sounds so much better than my stuff and then i kind of pause for a minute i think it's a little bit loud i'll just i'll just match that and listen again it's like oh no there it is it's it's you know it still sounds good, but my stuff also sounds good because yeah. all that was happening was it was was louder. So yeah, <clears throat> great name um, for the plugin, by the way, because that literally is like what you just said. I mean, 
I've actually done the same thing on my channel a couple of times where I've had, you know, do you prefer mix A or mix B and played it sort of like a blind test and they always would choose the louder one. And it is literally just the perception. It's what you're hearing at that time. It's what you're perceiving versus the other. So that's a, it's a, that's a really good name for the plugin, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's with hindsight. I wonder whether it was too clever. Um, you know, it's like loudness penalty, I think is a name that really works. It's lots of people misunderstand what it's about, but at least they think they know what it does and it makes them interested in it. Some people kind of go perception. Oh, what's that? I don't right. <laughs> you know. Maybe I, st but, but yeah, that's why we chose it because it, it does affect, and that's what, it, that's what you use it for. It, it automatically matches the loudness of two things. Um, typically a mastered and an unmastered, uh, song so that you can flick instantly between them it does sync compensation all the rest of it so you get a, a seamless transition so you don't get fooled i call it the loudness deception right it stops mm -hmm. you getting fooled by that um and it's just i mean it's something that it's one of the skills that you learn as a mastering engineer is how to loudness match um, and i still think that's a valuable skill to learn but i use it myself just because it's so much quicker and easier you know back in the day maybe you'd have mastered the song matched it with the the original think oh okay maybe i've just gone a little bit too far with the treble i'll just do oh yeah that's better Whereas with perception, you can go, okay, match, listen. Oh, yeah, I need to address that. Match again. Oh, that's better, but now there's this thing. Match again. And you can just really zone in the, on the fine details. Um, so it's super useful. And the new version um, is called Perception AB and enables you to do the same thing in a mix. So you can, for example, you could, you've applied a bunch of compression and EQ to your bass guitar. You can do a quick loudness match and then a comparison to make sure you've actually made it sound better rather than just making it a little bit louder. Um, and uh, you could then, you know, you could do the same thing for the drums and then you could do them together or separately. Uh, I mean, you could even bypass in it, all the processing in a mix with one click if you wanted to. Um, that's it's kind of fun, but I'm not sure how useful that is. But uh, yeah, so it's I, well, I'm really actually, proud of it. I, actually, um, that would be a really cool feature, too. I mean, Cakewalk has a feature that's built in that does that, but it kind of like there's like a click or a pop or a, a little bit. So it does that without any delay whatsoever. Like removes yeah, the com effects completely. It, yes, com completely seamlessly. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right. Lots of them, it'll take a while for all of them to switch, mm -hmm. and there might be some kind of disturbance. And, the, and then the other thing is, usually, quite a lot of the processing we're doing is making stuff sound louder. Right. Um, you know, if you've compressed something, you're going to have a bit of makeup gain on there. So overall, the level's going to come up. If if you've boosted any EQ, chances are it sounds a little bit louder. So that you know, you disable all the processing, and it automatically sounds worse just because it's quieter. Mm -hmm. um, so perception, yeah, does that in one one hit, but also with the loudness matched, so you hear that really, you know, fair comparison between the two. Wow, that would be so useful actually for when I do I do a lot of um, well, we have a monthly song contest, and everyone within the community will submit songs, then we have a listen together where we all listen to the songs together, and I give like some feedback on it, uh, whether it's professional or not, I don't know, but for the most part, people tend to get some value out of that. And then uh, we all will have a, once I choose a winner, the winner gets a free mix and master for me. And I usually do it live. So it's like about a two hour stream of me going through the whole song. And of course, please don't, don't hate on me, but my mastering is basically just sticking the one mastering processor on there and going, okay, we've done all the mixing. Now we got this on there to bring it up to loudness and to adjust the focus, the clarity and the punch. Um, but with that being said, there's one thing that I love to do at the end of that is say like, here's where we started and I'll take all the effects off and say, here's where we're at now. But I've always thought in the back of my mind after honestly listening to you for years and other individuals that this would be so much cooler if I could adjust the volume as well, because all they're hearing is how much louder it is. I'd love for them to hear like what the actual effects processing is doing. Uh, my delays and my reverbs and the stuff that I've thrown in there just sort of sweeten things up. So yeah, that would be an, that would be an awesome plug-in to own uh, is is it a standalone or is it just a plug-in that goes like on the master bus well you you use it in different ways <clears throat> so if you if you're using it for mastering you have one of them one instance on the master output okay. and then you put um an instance on every different every song um gotcha and you just okay. say okay i want this to be the source or the pre <clears throat> Um, it assigns it a number, so it says, okay, this is song one, this is song two, this is song three, and then it recognizes which one you're playing, and you can it'll match all of them, you can flick between them. Um, if you're using it in a mix, you use it slightly differently. You put one at the beginning of the, uh, basically, you know, before the first 
plug in in your chain and then you put another one at the end um so you'd have a pair a pre and a post on every channel um and then you can bypass each of those independently or you could there's a bypass all button that just will Wait. trigger all of them simultaneously um so you can and that's how so if you put say one on the bass one on the drums one on the guitars then you could do each of those separately but you could also do the entire rhythm section in one go or if you put one on every channel in the mix you can do the whole mix um that that sounds a little bit fiddly but actually we work pretty hard to make it you most daws you can just drag it across onto multiple channels and it'll yeah. auto configure itself so it's it's super quick to use awesome and i would assume too just by how the inner workings are i'm sure it probably doesn't take up much cpu usage at all no it's uh, um i've uh, people using it have uh, come back i haven't done this myself but i think 64 channels 128 channels should be able to especially on a mo modern cpu um should be able to cope pretty pretty easily with that wow wow awesome um we're getting closer to the end of our time here but i, I want to make sure i get um let's see i asked that one already you've actually the crazy thing is as you're answering these questions you've answered like seven of them in a row so that's really cool <laughs> um probably one question that i want to make sure that i get in here because it's something that i feel like not only do i get asked but i myself it's always been sort of mysterious to me because what I've noticed is on a professional master, there's, it, it seems like black magic or something that's being done to get these things to sound so wide and full when even the mix itself and the arrangement of that mix didn't even really, I mean, it added to that depth, but it didn't expand it. It's almost like the mastering engineer is able to take this and just put it outside the speakers, just like on the fringes what what's your thoughts on that and what are some ways that we could add depth and dimension to a a master so it's something that i like to play with i i, I love stereo um i just remember when i was uh, i think 20 i bought a bunch of cds they were these silver things that you used to play music on <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, but I bought a huge stack of them and I that had a there's a load of great there was some really kind of current stuff at the time um, but there was also Hunky Dory by David Bowie um, and Pet Sounds uh, by the mm. Beach Boys yes. which is was this classic album and it was a remaster of the original mono which is the way that the origin it was originally released and I listened to it for years and I enjoyed it I didn't love it and then I don't know 10 or 15 years ago they, they did a, a box set reissue where they did a complete stereo remaster of pet sounds um and it also had a bunch of outtakes and stuff it, anybody who's fans of that kind of era of music you have to listen to this stuff but i just remember listening to it in stereo for the first time just you know going oh wow now i get it suddenly it, it engaged me in a way that it hadn't before so it's it's a, it's a huge deal for me i mean it's it's interesting because you can't really add depth at the mastering stage um you can enhance what's there mm. i mean there are things that you can do to add depth there's there's some plugins out there you know there's there's one in isotope and there's a bunch of different ones that will they kind of blend in a little bit of delay and stuff they use this thing called the haas effect to to give you the illusion of um extra depth i'm not a big fan of that my opinion is if 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 the mix needs that it's probably better to go back and achieve it in the mix or it's, it's definitely better to go back and achieve it That's in the right. mix rather than trying to do it at the, the mastering stage but something that can be cool is just to use a really simple mid-side processing um tool you know so there's this idea of stereo, stereo is left and right um you can also do well technically speaking it's called the sum and difference so the sum is basically the mono it's the stuff in the center of the image and the difference is the stuff at the edges of the image um i've done a whole podcast on this topic in fact i've done a couple now <laughs> so i won't try and get too far into the weeds with it but what you can do is you can basically bring up that stuff at the edges if you like and if you push it far enough it can have that slightly outside the speakers feel what i would say is you have to be super careful with it um because you know just the right amount just like everything else in mastering you know just tweaking up the bass just that right amount can be perfect you tweak it up too much and it suddenly everything sounds lumpy and you know congested and, and just loses all its energy and it's wrong um the same with this if you have a mix that is a little bit clustered in the center and you can just open it out slightly by 
increasing the information at the sides of the image that can be a really nice thing and, and the, the client loves it and you know just and you go too far and it just sounds weird and wrong and kind of inside out and you know uh unpleasant so the, i mean the other thing you can do is you can use very carefully mid-side eq so you take that idea one stage further so rather than just you could think about it as if you want to increase the width you're basically reducing the amount of mono content a little bit so you hear more of the edges of the sound and by the way what that does is it makes us more aware of um the space and the reverb in the sound mm. so it can seem to add depth it's not i guess it is adding depth in the sense that there's more than there was in the mix but it's all stuff that was there anyway it's just making it more right. noticeable right um but you can literally separate that mid information and the, that side information or the, the difference signal and you can process them differently. Some people go so far as to use mid side compression. And I have only done that once in my entire career as a mastering engineer. I and it wasn't hugely successful when I did it. I did, it was a real rescue job on, on remastering a demo um, and it kind of improved things, but it, it probably caused as many problems as it fixed. So I would be super cautious about that personally. But a bit of mid-side EQ can be really nice. Let me just give you one example. If you think about a kind of straight-ahead rock song where you've got either double-tracked guitars or just one guitar in the left speaker and one guitar in the right speaker, you know, you know, bass drums and vocals down the center. Um, another thing that people all often do is low-cut the guitars to get rid of any kind of you know thumps and rumble and stuff off the the amps, and they want them to cut through. It's it's easy to go too far with that you know if you if the guitars are right there at the edges they need those low mids they need that muscle in the in the tone for me to really you know to make them chug and to make the, the speakers move and to give it the right feel if you've got a mix where the guitars at the edges sound a bit thin it can be really nice to go in with a bit of side eq and just boost up those low mids or maybe even a little bit lower down to put that muscle back in on those guitars without adding to what's in the mono signal right because in the in the mono you've got the vocals you don't want to muddy those up with low mids if if they're basically working you've got the bass guitar if that's already balanced you know you don't want to add any extra low mid or bass to that um the kick drum is there you know if, if you don't want to be making that sound ridiculous so it can be really nice um to give you that little bit of extra control at the mastering stage um but again, it's what I call a Spider-Man process. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, you've got to be super careful because it doesn't work completely separately on the mids and the sides. If you think about something that is panned somewhere in the middle in particular, some of that's in the middle, some of it's at the side. So if you EQ the side separately, if that thing was meant to be mono and you add some bass at the sides, then it's hard to describe in words you're basically kind of going to twist that sound in the stereo image you're going to s spread it out in the stereo image now that can sometimes especially with kind of electronic music for example sound quite nice and give you some extra space and dimension feeling just because you're kind of messing with the stereo image but if actually you want a really precise location of that sound it might be completely the wrong thing to do so you you know this stuff is is subtle um, and you, you know it's one of those 10 percent things you know you, I, well not even 10 percent use it every so often just for that uh to, to get that special effect for a particular song or, or whatever it might be um but yeah the, the, you, you can do stuff like that and i mean there's i mean there's amazing stuff coming along all the time um there's a plugin made by a company called leapwing uh called there's, there's two actually there's stage one and there's center one center one gives you extra control over the mono information stage one gives you extra control over the, the stereo information and they kind of go a step beyond the mid-side processing they use the same kind of uh, technology that's used in things like music rebalance plugins you know where you're the, the computer is going in and figuring out okay this is this is the guitar this is the vocals this is, you know in this case they're saying okay this is the center channel and you can go even further and get even more dramatic effects i mean it's 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 a really nice trick to pull as a mastering engineer if you want to impress your clients but again, I do feel like ideally it would be better to have a conversation with them and go back to the to the mix probably and improve things there instead. Um, but, you know, it, 
and and yeah that that really is a spider-man uh plugin because you you can just you know you could really mess things up um doing things like that but it can also be super useful sometimes awesome so i've got three more questions before i let you get back uh and the first is obviously where can people find out more about you if they wanted to work with you they wanted you to master a project for them where would be the best place for them to get a hold of you Okay, so, um, well, I mean, if you're interested in the kind of stuff we're talking about um, and you like podcasts, which I'm guessing you do because this is a podcast, um, then you probably like my podcast, which is called The Mastering Show, which you can find at themasteringshow.com or, you know, it's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all, all the usual places. Um, you could go to my website, productionadvice.co.uk. If you click on the About tab there, you can find information on how to contact me um, if you want to, if you're interested in my courses or um yeah if you want me to to do some mastering work for you um or you could just uh, look for me on social media i'm um on facebook and not so much on instagram but I'm, I'm even experimenting with tiktok these days mainly just to embarrass my kids um and uh, i'm on twitter as well although i'm not spending as much time there these days because it's just not as much fun anymore awesome so um i know i did have a few questions here in the chat but i feel like honestly he answered your guys's questions already like the okay. other seven that he's already answered of mine that I had already in the queue. I was like, wow, he's on a roll here. So excellent, excellent, um, just wealth okay, of knowledge. Okay, if you're sure, I don't mind hanging around for a few more minutes if there are any other questions, but... Um... Okay, cool. Um, I did see there was one from Jurgen, and it looks like I ended the Q&A before. So Jurgen, if you had that, if he didn't already answer the question, which I feel like he did answer that one, it was about um, loudness. Um, and then I think DJ had a question about a specific plugin set. Um, and I can't find out where the question went now. Uh, It'd be interesting to see the video of this played back. I've, I've cricked my <laughs> neck really badly. So every time I look over here to get my water, I wince slightly. I don't know whether that's going to be visible. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not seeing the, seems like he asked a question about a specific group of plugins that was made by a company and I can't remember what they were at this point. Um, mm -hmm. But we can always, I'll follow up some way, shape or form and, and try to get you guys an, an answer back if we don't. Uh, sure. But thank you so much yet again for coming on. Um, now I have, a two-part question, and this is what I like to call the curveball question. Are we ready for this, okay. ladies and gentlemen? The curveball question. So, oh, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. Now he's popped back in. <laughs> the soft tube Weiss collection for mastering. He wanted to know oh, yeah. um, if you have any words to say about that. So I haven't used them much, mainly because... Uh, I tried them when they first came out um, and I use Wavelab as my mastering DAW. I, I really oh, okay. like it. It's super powerful. Um, I, I'm, I really enjoy it. Um, but it is a little bit um, finicky about third party plugins. And when I originally tried out the SoftTube stuff, it wasn't working the, or the Vice um, plugins specifically because Vice was one of the big names in mastering in hardware. Back when I started, it was like the EQ, the limiter, the DS, especially all were um, you know, very highly thought of, super expensive. Um, so, and I didn't use them myself back back in the day, but when they came out as plugins, I was interested to experiment. So, yeah, I tried them, and you know, they, they seem to work well. I mean, honestly, I feel like they didn't seem to add anything in my testing that I didn't feel I couldn't get somewhere else already. Um, you know, I already have a bunch of great EQs, uh, limiters, DSs, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so that combined with the fact that they were just, they were eating a lot of CPU and kind of being a little bit unreliable in Wavelab at that time. And it literally was as soon as they got released. Um, I kind of didn't pursue them. I haven't been back. So they may well have fixed all of, they probably have fixed all of that by now. They probably run super solid in, in Wavelab. Um, and I, sh I should probably go back and experiment again. Um, but yeah, I mean, so they are, you know, they're, they're plugin 
versions of some of the most respected mastering hardware ever you know i mean s same thing um can be said about the the tc electronic md4 plugins so when i was mastering we had a hardware unit called the system 6000 cost tens of thousands of pounds dollars um it was one of the first touchscreen devices i ever used had touch sensitive faders on it, it was really nice because you can have eq on a fader which is something i i really enjoy you used to be able to do that on the sony stp 1000 as well um back in the day and yeah it had incredible converters and uh just uh, it was surround enabled from the get-go oversampled eq which was you know not a, a common thing back then um and as i say it used to cost tens of thousands of dollars and now you can pick up pretty much the whole thing for a few hundred dollars in in plug-in form which is unbelievable That's insane. Um, and it, and is you know really good to just to have access to that again without having to invest in in a, the, the hardware but um yeah so i i definitely think you know if people are interested in those they should they should experiment and, and see how they they get on awesome okay so now uh, thank you, DJ, for reposting that question. He said he the reason why he took it down is because you had your own plugins and he didn't want to, maybe he's not comfortable. So, And I, I figured I've watched enough of your interviews and, and followed you long enough that I know that you uh, definitely don't mind talking about other people's plugins or anything like that. So, okay, so now back to the scary, not so scary, um, curveball question. So the first part of the question is, Ian Shepard, what is your favorite color color yes sir uh, blue dark blue what does the color blue taste like <laughs> um i feel like it would be easier to say i know what it sounds like although <laughs> even that i'm not 100 percent sure um i think it probably tastes like a slightly coffee flavored chocolate Ooh. but that could just be because it's my favorite color and coffee and chocolate are two of my favorite things oh foods. my goodness so. you've just become my favorite person on earth <laughs> coffee because don't mind if i do <laughs> yeah and see dark blue coffee mug you see Ooh, so there you nice, go nice outside of black which is my main uh color here on the channel blue is my favorite color as well. So great minds. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ian, not only for, for coming on and sharing your wealth of knowledge, but also for agreeing to stay on just a little bit longer uh, to make sure we had everyone's questions answered. No, Once again, pleasure. greatly appreciate you and all the work that you've been doing. Uh, keep it up. Keep encouraging the audio community and helping us to stay in track with the loudness wars and, or, or the lack thereof. I feel like it's getting, at least to my estimation, I feel like it's getting better. And um, a lot of people now are starting to, to be more mindful about just how much they're smashing stuff. Um, so that's great. Um, but I would love to um, extend a hand as well if you need anything whatsoever. Um, I don't necessarily have, you know, I have, a, I have a platform and I have a little bit of mixing knowledge that I've borrowed over the years. Uh, but I'd be more than ha happy to help you in any way, shape, or form that I can as well. So if you ever need anything and you want to reach out, I'm here for you. Thank you so much again. And uh, from the community here today, I'm sure they're all very, well, got lots of thanks in the in the chat already. So it was a, a really great chat. I look forward to uh, possibly having you on for a, a second go somewhere down the road. So Sure. Be happy to. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, really enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that is going to conclude our live stream today. Thank you all so much for showing up. And Ian, if you got just a second before you go, okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, real quickly, I'm going to discuss a, a business proposition here with Mr. Ian, and then I will uh, we'll go ahead and, and call it a day. But thank you all so much for showing up. Love each and every one of you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this today.